So what are you guys? We're part of the Sparkwood family. Hi guys, so before we can get started with anything, we need to understand a little bit about the normal distribution. So um, let me talk briefly about it. Although you've probably already seen this, I mean, from the last midterm, it is good to talk briefly about it, just so we're all up to speed. Um, <clears throat> normal distribution looks kind of like this. Well, not this bad, but kind of like this, okay? Uh, and, you know, the mean, the population mean sits right here, so the average sits right there, but also the median, the mode also sit right here. So a couple things. You have the mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode, okay? Uh, the second thing is, he's pretty symmetric. So if you look at this guy, he's symmetric. And you can kind of see that in the picture, save for the fact that I kind of messed it up. But um, number three is, of course, he's um, asymptotic. Uh, <clears throat> this one's not so big a deal. All it means is this guy just keeps going on and on forever and never quite flatlines at zero. Okay? But so you might be thinking something like, so what good is that going to do us, right? Because how many things are asymptotic? Like things we're going to model. They're not going to go up infinitely high and infinitely low, right? But for all effective purposes, once you get outside of three standard deviations above and below the mean, you've pretty much gotten this entire curve. So in that sense, the normal distribution is good. Okay? It's going to model a lot of things really, really well. And we'll see it is the distribution to go to in a second. Okay, but first, um, how do I use this sucker? So, so different you have normal distributions have different means and different standard deviations, right? Uh, but they all have this property that when you look at the mean, if you go out one standard deviation to the right or to the left, you'll always capture basically 68% of this curve. Some profs have you learn, memorize that, some don't. Uh, if you go out two standard deviations, so two sigma, right, then you're going to capture about 95%. Okay? And if you go out three, like we said, you get pretty much everything. Uh, I think you get like 99.7. Okay, and that's for three standard deviations. So three sigma. Okay. So I don't want to spend too much time on this since you saw this on your last midterm, but um, we should talk the mean, of course, represents the population mean. So this is the average in the standard sense of the word, right? And sigma, the standard deviation, that represents how far from the average is a guy on average. Okay, so how far from the average are you on average? So it's a measure of spread. Okay, okay so what's that kind of mean intuitively? Let's say the mean is 100, and let's say the standard deviation is like 10. That means if you pick somebody at random, it's not that unusual to find someone between, say, 100 and 110, and it's not that unusual to find someone between, say, 90 and 100. So you can go up and down by standard deviation, and you're kind of average in a sense, okay, or pretty normal. Okay. Beyond that, then you start to get a little freakishly high or a little freakishly low and all that good stuff. Okay? Okay, so no big deal. So I get it. The average is the average. The standard deviation is generally how spread out guys are. If you're within a standard deviation, you're pretty, quote, normal, whatever that means, right? And if you're more than one standard deviation above or more than one standard deviation below, then you're starting to get like a little freakishly high or freakishly low. Okay? So no big deal. Okay, so um, good. Then let's do a problem with this. Again, I'm going to do it kind of quickly because I'm assuming from the previous midterm you're comfortable with this. But just in case, okay. So let's say you've got a standard deviation where the average eats 100 pounds of gummy bears per day, okay? And let's say, for example, like the standard deviation is 10, okay? So that means most people out there will eat between 90 to 110 pounds of gummy bears per day, okay? And I want to know, what's the likelihood that you pick somebody at random and that person eats more than, so let's say uh, more than... let's say, 140 pounds of gummy bears, okay? So I want to know, what's the likelihood that you pick somebody at random from the population and you find that they eat more than 140 pounds of gummy bears per day, okay? Okay, so what's the setup? As always, we'll draw in that average here for 100, right? Okay, and remember, this is a frequency distribution, so you line up all the different possible scores, and technically you're going on the population, you're asking people how many pounds of gummy bears do you eat, right? And if a bunch of people eat 100, then they get a high mark over here. And if not so many people eat 150 pounds of gummy bears per day, then they're kind of over here. You know, the mark for that's low. Okay, no big deal. Okay, so uh, let's try that. So first thing I want to do is, you can talk about numbers, right? But this would suck, because 
if I had a different normal distribution, I'd have a different mean, a different standard deviation, I'd have to look each one of these guys up, and I'd have to have a separate table for each. And that's really a pain in the butt. So what I want to do instead is, we want to, well, what we want to do is we want to standardize it. So to standardize it, what you do is you take this guy and you convert the actual scores into something called z-scores. This is just for our convenience. Z-scores are a nice, nice way of converting these scores. We can use just one table to figure things out. Okay? Uh, and you know, that kind of makes sense because remember, the defining property of the normal curve in a way is the fact that once you get one standard deviation above and below, you always hit that same percentage, like 68%. Okay? And if you go two, you always hit 95, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's do that. So how do I, how, what does a z-score mean? Do so you guys remember? It represents the number of standard deviations above or below the mean your score is. So the first thing I want to do is convert. So if you look at that 140, right? I want to know how many standard deviations above or below the mean is 140. So the first thing is I take 140 and I subtract 100 from it. Everybody agree? So let's just plot it down here. So here's 140. And we know it's here. And we know this difference is 40. And that's what we got, right? But let's say you had 24 eggs. And I wanted to know how many dozen you had. If that's the case, you would take your 24 eggs and you divide by the number in a dozen to say you have two dozen. Same thing, right? So over here, you've got 40 points of difference, but I want to know how many standard deviations fit in there. So you look at your 40 points, and you divide by the number of points in the standard deviation, which would be 10, and that would give you 4. But that makes sense, right? Because you are 40 points above the mean, right? But each standard deviation is worth 10 points. So if you're 40 points above, and each standard deviation is worth 10, you really are 4 standard deviations above the mean. So that's what a z-score represents. So if you had a z-score of, say, plus 4, that means you are four standard deviations above the mean. If you had a z-score of, say, like negative two, that would mean you're two standard deviations below the mean. Okay, so this number that we ended up with is ridiculously high, but that's fine, we can go with that. So we now have the z-score is plus four. Okay, okay, a couple of tricks. Depending on the sort of table your book uses, you gotta remember the fact that the entire curve is 100%, and half the curve is, of course, 50%, and you can use tricks. For example, some books are really nice. Once we look up this z-score, we convert this z-score to plus four, Right, so that's our z-score. Then you can look this up in a table, or oh, no, it's too high number, but let's pretend. Let's pretend four is actually in your book. Then it would go here, maybe it would draw this, right? If it gives you the area of this shaded region, or the percentage for this shaded region, then we're good. So if this were like, for example, make up a fake number, 0 0.001, like that. Totally fake number, but let's say that's what the table gave you, then that's the likelihood that you're gonna get a score 140 or more, and that's what we want, okay? However, if your table didn't give you this, but only gave you this, and let's say this was something like 0.499, like that, right? Then you would know 140 to 100, well, to the mean, would be 0.499, but you want 140 and up, and you agree the whole thing over here is 50%, so that would be 0 0.500 minus 0.499, which would be 0 0.001, okay? Just talking about, you know, you might have to make minor adjustments depending on the sort of table they give you, but the procedure is still the same. Take your score, convert it to a z-score, look up that z-score value in the table, and then use whatever they give you in the table to figure out your answer, okay? Uh, so let me outline the general procedure again. By the way, you can run it backwards, but since I feel like most people are probably comfortable with this, uh, you know what, I take the back. We'll do a problem with this in a sec, okay? But first, let's but remember the procedure. My bad, I should have written this out last time, or at least I'm doing it now. Remember the general procedure of computing a z-score? You took your score, you subtracted the mean, right? So remember before we had 140, and we subtracted the mean as 100, and then we divided by the number of points in a standard deviation. So that's the general procedure for getting the z-score, okay?